Hey everyone, welcome to the newest episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. Today's guest joins me from Naples, Florida. He's an indie pop, singer-songwriter, producer, and multi-instrumentalist who has a new single out right now called Santa Monica Boulevard, and he even worked with a previous On That Note guest, Juliana Maria, on her debut single, Loverboy. Before we get the episode started, Please make sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And don't forget to follow me at Parker Whirling on Instagram as well as at on that note underscore podcast. And on that note, please welcome North XIX. I'm sitting here with North XIX, an indie pop singer songwriter, producer, and multi instrumentalist based in Naples, Florida. Everybody needs to go check out his newest single, Santa Monica Boulevard, which was out September 3rd. It's got great uh, fuzzed out guitars, plenty of catchy vocal hooks. Uh, I loved it as the second I heard it. Uh, How was the writing and the recording process going into this song? And was it any different compared to some of your previous releases over the years? So for Santa Monica Boulevard, I actually wrote that before any of the other songs that are out now um i wrote it over a year ago right before i went to la and um i took the same approach where i had the i have i usually have this thing where i have like a phrase or a word that i just kind of like can center a song idea around and it just sounds really cool to me um So, I mean, that was consistent with the rest of my writing, but um, Santa Monica Boulevard was definitely the turning point from my writing into what it was, into what we know now, like the Where Will You Go, Wasn't It Fun, all of those songs. That I would say confidently that Santa Monica is that turning point. So what, what would you say is like such a clear difference between this one and the previous? Like what strikes you as like, the next step you know what I mean um with the previous songs before or well with Santa Monica Boulevard what feels different that you feel like okay now this is the next evolution okay um for this one I feel like I completely let loose on production and the vocal the stacks the writing um the other my all the other songs I would kind of like hold back a little bit and um try to make it I would overthink the writing process way too much and for this one um I definitely just kind of did everything that just came to me um and didn't really try to think about it too much um yeah and just tried to go as big as I could with the punk production to the chorus vocals so yeah, it does feel like you really leaned into the punk side of things, especially with the guitar. Was it kind of hard to get to that point? I know for a lot of artists I've talked to, they usually start out the first few songs. Maybe it doesn't feel like it, but usually you are holding back a little bit, or at least you're more, what's the word, self-conscious, I guess, about what you're going to do. You're almost like third-eyeing yourself and judging it. Um, was it hard to break that or did it just kind of happen? And then you stood back and you're like, Oh, this is, this is something maybe in the past I would have been more scared to do. Um, I've always been into punk music. So quick context. Um, I used to release music under different names. And so I have about like three years of like songwriting and producing and engineering before we got to North XIX. Um, and for this one though, it, it definitely came to me and I was just like, Oh, like I don't ever, I didn't ever think I could do a pop punk track like that. I would always try to, and I wouldn't 
get the right tempo down, the right key, the chords didn't sound right, I would, again, overthink it, that bird's eye view of me just sitting at the computer, like, stressing out over it, and then this one came along, and it was just, it just happened, and I was like, cool, I, I stayed up all night doing this, like, literally, like, 12 hours straight, I stayed up producing it. That's funny. Um, yeah. I've talked with people about the idea of when you kind of hit that stride, it's almost like, to me, it's like a radio antenna and like you just catch this thing from the ether, this like yeah. song. And if you, you can be, I'm scared to like stop writing because it might not come back, right? Like yeah. I try to get it all down as much as I can in one setting because I'm worried that that train will leave and I'm not going to make the rest of it, right? Yeah. So did you have it done in 12 hours for the most part, like the draft, I guess? Yeah, um, that's how all, a lot of my songs come together. It's just kind of like this four to eight hours, depends if I'm producing it or not, um, four to eight hours of just straight not leaving my laptop. And then I get like the rough cut of it, but I very minimally go back and redo vocal takes. Um, like when I'm recording a song or a vocal take or a guitar take, like I try to get it as perfect as it can be within that own take. So I don't have to go back and two days later, my voice is different yelling or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I usually do it all in one sitting and just kind of like get the rough in like 12 hours. And then I come back to a few days later and like redo the mix, touch up some Foley stuff and lull pockets to add cool things so do you feel like you have to give it like some rest after such a long period of time working on it yeah i mean you could even work and write a song in an hour and you you still need to step back from it and let your ears reset from the song from the frequencies that you kept hearing over and over and over again um because it's it's the same concept as like showing it to another engineer and they'll hear something that you don't because you just spent the last one to 12 hours within this song. Um, so yeah, taking that break and coming back, it like refreshes everything about it. Yeah, uh, if you keep your nose buried into whatever project you're doing, it's almost like you're way too close to it to really evaluate it on a bigger picture and showing it to someone who you trust, who knows what they're talking about, can really be such a, a benefit. And it's even interesting to show it to someone uh, who you trust, who has like no real experience with creating music. They just like listening to it because you kind of get a more general public opinion about it, which can also be really helpful, especially, I don't know about you, but vocals for me can always be something I'm nervous about. Uh, I think most people in general, most artists can be very self-critical about their vocals or, or about any particular thing and getting those kind of opinions from people. Maybe you'll hear something, maybe you'll think you're really like not hitting this note or whatever and other people don't care. Like they don't even think about it. It's just, we're so close to this project. You know, you have to take a step back and let other people's add, other people add perspective. Yeah, a hundred percent. Cause that like with the vocal thing, oh man, because I I record with auto tune on. I I never track my vocals without auto tune, and so if so I'm you just, have it on while you're actually recording, so you hear it in your headphones, auto tune on. Yeah, gotcha. Um, I don't know. It just, of course, like when you take the auto tune off, it's gonna be so flat and it's gonna sound awful. There's a better word for that, but um pure garbage that's what it would sound like without the auto-tune and <laughs> to um, put it lightly yeah to put it lightly and so but that's just how it works um like within auto-tune like you have to use your voice in a different way to make it hit to trigger the auto-tune differently i mean young thug talks about it in some of his interviews i'm pretty sure um but yeah um auto-tune definitely ruins 
that perspective for me because I'm like, oh man, like I can sing. I have 15 years of choir experience and like 10 years of acapella groups and this, that, and this, that. And then you go, you open the where will you go file and you take off the auto tune. You're like, dude, I don't think this kid's ever sang in his life. <laughs> so it's weird. It's such a, a hard thing to get over. Like, even yeah. if you're experienced, like you said, 15 years, uh, it's also different hearing it hearing yourself sing if you're just singing out like maybe with a guitar or something yeah but hearing your recorded voice that's different that was so hard for me to grasp when i started recording my own music that recording your own vocals you hear every tiny little detail or hiccup or whatever yeah it takes everything to not uh over analyze yeah, i literally talk to myself as i'm recording <laughs> what what kind of things do you say? I'm like, oh, come on, bro. Like, you can get that. You've been doing this, like, ten times in a row. Like, this is easy. <laughs> like, what is this? Giving yourself, like, a pep talk. Yeah, or it's 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 just like, what was that? Like, come on. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I know people who I've been making music with for years at this point who, like, right now as I'm recording through my mic, I have input monitoring on. I know people that I've mm, been yeah. friends with for years that can not have input mo input monitoring on while they're recording. Really? Yeah. Like at all. That's wild. Yeah. I feel like I'd have to. They they think it makes their vocals better and they are proud more more proud of the vocal takes without input monitoring. And so of course to me it's going to sound better if they're more proud of it. Right. Um so I I really don't think there's a difference, but end result it works. It sounds amazing. So it's 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 funny seeing people's uh, different quirks within recording, especially if you like record other people for like a living. Yeah, so. that is. Uh, I mean, it's not the process necessarily. It's the results. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can say you know process matters in certain situations, of course. But if the artist, like you said, feels the most proud of it, that's gonna be the one. It's kind of hard to argue with that. Unless it's like really rough and you got to have a pep talk yeah. with them. <laughs> but, you know, I would think 95% of the time, if they're proud of it, then it's it's probably the take. Um, yeah. I'm curious to know that you had three years of experience under a different name before North XIX. What made you want to change the name? Was it a style change or did you just want to uh, go under a different moniker? Um, so years ago, like when I first got this laptop, I went under like my, like a variation of my legal name, Garth. Um, and I didn't like it at all. And I was sitting in my friend's house and I was like, I cannot be Garth like, <laughs> as I'm releasing this music. Like I, like what I'm the, my process of like writing, producing, like, I feel like Oh, what's what's his name? Precious, like when he gets the ring, he turns oh, into like Gollum. Smeagol. Gollum, yes, yeah, Smeagol. I feel like Garth is Smeagol, and then like <laughs> Nor oh, <laughs> while writing funny. is like Gollum. Yeah, so yeah, I have yeah. to I have to create this like alter ego. Um, and so I was at my friend's house, and I was like, uh, I need a new name. And I just sat there with my eyes closed, and I like pictured. Like, all these different scenarios of, like, myself on stage and da-da-da-da-da. And the word North just came. I was like, cool. Has mm -hmm. no meaning to me. Um, but it sounds cool. It sounds really cool. So I'm just go with it. And then did all of that for a year under North with a period. And then I was talking to Contradash in his Discord server. And he was, he was kind of going off about, like, SEOs and how they're, like, super important. Yeah. And I was like, oh, man, I was like. My Instagram and Twitter handle has always been North XIX. Like, as soon as I changed my name to North from Garth, like, it's always been North XIX. I don't know why I didn't change it s sooner, like, my artist name to that. But I was talking with Contradash, and he was like, change it. And so I did. And then there I deleted everything. I wanted a fresh restart. It, it's both. It was, it was a new name and a style change. Because um, before that, I was doing, like, very heavy... Juice World inspired kind of production with like, I mean, my vocals just sound the same no matter what, but um, 
it was more leaning towards like the rap side and I just like wasn't proud of it and I didn't like how I had to create myself in like a different manner to make those songs so Hmm. that's interesting uh do you feel like north i mean the writing of north x i x is different from garth in a way or at least how you feel like the personalities does it feel like after the whole juice world phase kind of thing do you feel like you've now kind of come into like a full circle like you're kind of both Gollum and Smeagol in a way? Yeah, so now if now it feels like North is just a puppet on my hand. Okay, it's still it's, you, it's just like a version. Yeah, and it's not you don't see my mouth moving when he speaks. You see his mouth moving when he speaks. I like that analogy. It's like a ventriloquist doll. Ven Yeah. Ventriloquist doll. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I kind of I like that. I, I never really thought of that, and I had kind of the opposite um, journey because the first thing I ever put out was under a different name. It was like under a pseudonym, kind of mm-hmm. like the way Tame Impala is like one guy or like there's a bunch of you know band name, but it's actually one person doing it. Yeah, uh, I always thought that was cool, and then I just felt like something about my name. Well, I'm also an actor, so it's like it kind of wanted people to know that I did both instead of it being the separate thing. And then, you know, and then the podcast was like, Oh, I should do the podcast. And it's like, I should have that as my own name. So it's like one thing. Um, but I, I still loved the idea of having like a pseudonym. You know what I mean? Cause it was like my name, like when someone, I say my name, nobody's going to have, uh, like an image in their head unless they actually know me. Whereas if there's a name of yeah. it, like, it was called Focal Feature. So, like, if somebody thinks of Focal Feature, everybody has, like, an image of something of what that could mean. But my name, no one's going to be, like... Yeah. They're not going to come up with anything other than, like, a white guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I get that. I get that. So what would you say is uh, your favorite part of the creation process definitely not production i hate that really i hate producing for myself okay um it's just kind of overall i don't have the skill set the experience in it you know what i mean i just can't stick with it so i never get like in turn like the ten thousand hours of okay um Honestly, I I would say writing because that's like my whole thing. Like I label myself as <clears throat> a writer first. Um, but honestly, I love engineering. Like okay. not pressing record and doing my lines, but like post effects, um, like post processing. Yeah. Um, that's like besides the actual lyrics and the melodies that the artist is singing, that's where you get into like the other important half of the artistry that comes within the song you know what i mean every diff- every other artist has a different and unique way they engineer their music so like of course we can look at like ysl and like Lil baby and gunna and how they engineer their vocals versus someone like drake or like kendrick they all have their own quirks within their music for me personally it's I amp up distortion on all my backing vocals and I put this flanger around it and it's crazy. Mm-hmm. And that's like my thing. Um, and I wouldn't be able to figure that out. I, I wouldn't have been able to just go into a studio and been like, make it sound cool and then have them by chance come up with that. You know what I mean? Right. I was able to do it myself. And so I, yeah, again, it's like the other most important part of like the artistry within the music. Yeah, it's amazing the personality that comes out in the things that maybe the average person isn't going to think about, like the way vocals are produced. And it's I feel like that is such a fine-tuned art. Like, there's so many different ways you can produce a vocal, but I think the average person is not going to be paying attention to, like, 
oh, that sounds like it's doubled there, or it sounds like there's a slight distortion or a slight flange. Like, not yeah. most people are ever thinking of that. And yet, it becomes a part of this person's sound, even if it's a subtle thing. And then, of yeah. course, on top of all that, there's the instrumentation and then the arrangement and all of that. I, I see why that would be such a, a uh, enticing thing about it, especially if you're writing, because it's almost like writing, but you're not writing melody or uh, lyrics. You're, you're like writing the feeling. Mm. Like you're, you're embedding it. It's almost like tattooing like the feeling of like what you want the song to be. That's how I think of it. Yeah, or even like the music part of it is the skin that you're tattooing the melody and the lyrics on top of. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, you said that you you do like producing for other artists and uh, yeah. the way I found out about you is from Juliana Maria who's a yeah. uh, single lover boy you produced with her. So how was that experience? Uh, what did the collaboration look like? Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, I rarely run into people that I can just like call or they call me and have an idea and I'm just like yeah like let's do it you know what I mean like I'm 100% with it because sometimes I'll get calls and like yo like can you do this this and this for a beat and I'm like oh, I like really don't want to do this <laughs> um but with Juliana it was literally just she called me and she was like hey I have this written can we get a beat for it and I was like I can try Cause I've been in like this really weird, like even currently, like right now for the past like year, it's been this on and off break, burnout, hiatus, like back and forth. I have an old song that I finished mixing and drop. So it was, a, it's been a mess. Um, so I was like, I'll try. And then, yeah, um, I did the guitars, did the drums and it was like really bare bones. And then she's like, we need to have more. And so then I sat on FaceTime with her for like, four or five hours um adding more the guitar solo that you hear in it the beat breaks the bridge which is my absolute favorite part i love that bridge i don't know Every, yeah when i made it i was like it was i think it was like three in the morning and i was like screaming my parents are like like right there <laughs> i'm like let's go um but yeah she fell asleep and i finished it two hours before her studio session. Wow, dude, that's insane. Like t total time crunch there. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like that pressure to get it done quickly um, was helpful or do you feel like you wish you could have had extra time? Oh no, once I packaged, like zipped it and sent it off to, hold on. Give me one second. Okay, it's still recording. Good. Um, once I pa zipped it up and sent it over to her engineer, um, I was completely satisfied with it. Um, I sent the stems over, like the full track out. Um, so if there were any issues, any effects that needed to be tweaked, added, removed, the engineer could do it. Um, and that was something that like Juliana could have like complete communication and control over so she's not calling me and i'm like somewhere else and she's like well you need to take this effect off right right blah 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 um yeah i was really happy with it and then when i got it back um i literally think the only thing that i was like oh i don't think that was supposed to be in there is the intro there's like this really really high pitched like guitar it's like Dun, 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 dun. it's like super high up there it sounds like a tin can being flicked um i was like i'd not expect that to make it in there um odd i don't but even know it if worked I, out if it I worked out it. yeah oh, the whole sound or the whole song is like a total banger it's it was cool to hear that um because i didn't know you until she told me i'm like oh well i gotta go check out his other stuff and it's fun to hear <laughs> What you, what you do is yeah. similar, but it has definitely more of a punk undertone to it, where hers is like Ariana Grande. Uh, 
but yeah. it, it fits so well. What would uh, what would you say that that collaboration taught you, if anything, that you want to implement into future uh, production sessions? That boxes are so stupid. Like putting yourself as a producer in a box, um, yourself as an artist in a box, as an engineer, and it's kind of like, well, directly speaking for me, I make a lot of punk, alternative, anti-pop, whatever you want to call it, and if Juliana came to me and was like, hey, can you make a pop beat? Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I don't make pop, and it's like, okay, like, why, like, why wouldn't I try for that anyway, you know what I mean? Like, it's better to try for something and kind of have it mediocre and then refine it than not try at all. You know, it's, yeah, uh, it's, it's annoying how like sometimes I get myself into that like thought pattern where it's like, Oh, well I make punk alternative music, whatever you want to call it. Like I can't go and make a piano ballad. Like, Sometimes I think that. I'm like, ah, well, I can't do it. I'm like, there's literally no point. I'm creating restrictions for myself, for the people around me. If I kept thinking that way a month ago, two months ago, then we would have never gotten Loverboy yeah. in the way that it is. Um, so, yeah. That really reminds me of a quote that I wish I could remember exactly who said it. Uh, it was some music podcast interview. Maybe it was like Zane Lowe or, or Broken Record with Rick Rubin, but they were talking about how their favorite house music producers don't listen to electronic music, really, or don't listen to house music. Because when once they start making house music, they have so much of a background and other things that they can bring to it that like, if all you did was listen to pop punk your whole life and you make pop punk you're just going to be drawing from this uh this field that is already existing but if you listen to if you're eclectic and listen to a bunch of different things you have so many things to pull from that other people probably won't have yeah um yeah i mean i i always listen to like my older sister loves country um like I'm, I'm not a country person at all. That is like yeah. the last genre you will catch me listening to. But sometimes she has it on whenever she's in town. I'm listening. I'm like, that's hard. <laughs> what? What? What are some examples? Like, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to give you out the top of my head because I'm awful with names. But there's like melody lines that sometimes the drums in country music are like good, like really good. Um, so I, I I know exactly what you're talking about. It's you don't you don't think that other artists that we gain inspiration from, per se, listened to everything that we're listening to now to get where they're at. No, they listen to every possible thing ever before they could piece together what they wanted. Right. It's funny to think about artists who you love who are like maybe really in the pocket of one genre and then you hear them talk about how much they love a completely different thing like yeah. i love james blake and he was like i think barter six is one of the best albums of all time yeah. like, what <laughs> and now i now i kind of hear it in his music but at first like those first two albums he put out it was like i was shocked but yeah. now it makes sense to me why he thinks that because this newer music sounds a little bit more into that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, that's what I tell everyone um, that comes up to me that's like, I want to get in, into music. Like, this is my first song. Like, I get feedback. And as soon as I listen to their song, I can be like, I can pick out what artist was yeah. their main inspiration. Mm -hmm. Popular one, Juice World. Um, especially when I started making music, that's what everyone was gaining inspiration from, kind of like moving with the trends and everything. Um, and they would always come to me and I would, I would have these conversations with them and I'd be like, listen to your inspirations, inspiration. Like, 
go like if you're inspired by if I'm inspired by Fall Out Boy, which is like my number one like band that I grew up on. I mean, of course I'm going to listen to Fall Out Boy a lot because I just like them, but I'm going to go back and listen to what they listen to. Like what inspired them from the 80s, 90s all the way up until 2001 for them to make this band and like their album runs. You know what I mean? Um it could be it could be said for any artist. Um, but we get so caught up in the now and like who's successful now that we forget, like everything has roots that go like way beyond comprehension. So yeah, like we're all building on top of each other, you know, and whether you're consciously aware of it or not, you are taking pieces and bits from all these other artists. Uh, and you know, the last thing you want to do is just pick one artist and be like, I'm going to do that. Cause then your stuff is just going to sound like that person. But if you have like a huge array of people to choose from, and of course you're always going to have that one or two, a uh, few artists that you love and that you worship, yeah. but you'll have so many other things that you pull from them. I love Radiohead. They're like my favorite band ever, but I've never, I've all, I don't think I've ever put out a song that sounds like Radiohead. And that's not intentional. Like, I would love to write stuff like them, yeah. but it's just like, I don't know. Maybe that subconsciously comes in, but I've never, like, I would love to do that. But I'm sure there are people that, you know, their favorite group, you would never realize it because the stuff they make doesn't really sound like it. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Forget it. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> it, I think this just like dropped a little bit. Sorry. Um, no, you're good. Yeah. Artist inspiration. Uh, roots. 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 Okay. Yeah. Like, pe- pe- yeah, people get caught up too much in the now and they like i said i'm just repeating myself but go back a little bit further you'll understand the culture more you'll understand why the words were written in that order like this is what it was this is what i was gonna say today you can kind of hear the cliche lyrics within rap um pop rock and any genre uh especially rap it's kind of like the codeine the drug abuse depression and it's the what what is that called like not trigger words but um can't think of it basically hot words that are hot in culture right now yeah. um and people just kind of hear that and they're like easy to digest and they're like that kind of gets my point across and he inspires me da, 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 he's popular now and then they just kind of write their song based off of that kind of regurgitating everything that they're inspiration was saying before them but if they go back and it's like okay why is he saying this like where did he get his lyrical inspiration from to say this before that and then everything can grow a lot yeah. more smoothly <laughs> and it's hard to avoid that at first like oh yeah there's nothing wrong with trying to emulate an artist that you love at first yeah i wasn't trying to put that down at no, all no, no, no. yeah it's just it's one of those things you you can't really avoid it it takes like a, a savant to really just you know be so expressive in themselves that they don't listen to other artists and don't care about what other people are doing it's like we're all looking for something to grasp onto right yeah and then eventually you find yourself or you or you don't find yourself, but you gradually are learning more and more about yourself that you can implement into your songs that are unique to you that nobody else could try to replicate. Yeah. It's all Legos in a big Lego set, building blocks for a bigger building or whatever. I keep hitting this. Um, (laughs) That's okay. And it... Yeah. You whether it is like the inspirations inspirations or kind of like the different genres <clears throat> besides like what you grew up on and what you love like they're all individual pieces and it's like okay like 
I'm going to pick this from this and that from that. And then however many months later, you have North. Right. You know what I mean? You have Simon, you have Juliana, you have Dev, you have the China Blue. Like, you have all of these people. Um, and the process is, is basically the same for everyone um, within kind of, like, the rules of, like, going around and not limiting yourself within the confines of your own like or enjoyments or whatever the word is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, that's going to take us over to the last five where I'm just going to ask you five questions and then we'll be out of here. All right. Number one, you actually told me before we started the show, uh, but logic or Ableton logic. Yeah. All day. Me personally, yeah. I mean, now they got the same features. Right. At this point, yeah. once, Lo- once Ableton put comping in, I feel like that changed the game for Ableton users. Yeah. Because oh, that yeah. was the one thing that I know people who used Ableton were, like, so annoyed by. Yeah. And, and like, also... I, yeah, I couldn't do that. I have to comp. Yeah. And then the beat sequencer in Logic uh, in the update... Yeah, that's right. I forgot they did that. That massive, that massive update. Once they did that update, I was like, okay, there's no difference between these two now. Right. My friend, one of the guys I interviewed on this show, mm. he he's Team Logic all the way. He was like, Ableton looks like just like a bland Microsoft Excel. Like, why would I want to? <laughs> it kind of does. <laughs> it kind of does though. He's not wrong. I mean, I I literally learned how to mix on a YouTube YouTube tutorial on Ableton. But since oh, they're so similar, yeah. like with track stacks and like how the buses work and all of that, like since right. I literally just could be like, okay, like this means this in logic. Exactly. So cool. Well, question number two is what do you think is a perfect album front to back? Oh boy. You can name a few too. I remember you asking this in your other interviews, and I was like, I need to think of this. Like, yeah. I, it's I'm, a doozy. I, yeah, it is a doozy. I'm awful with picking favorites of all times. It's like, it could be a f- your favorite show, your favorite food, your favorite movie. I'm like, well, I don't know. It's a lot um, of pressure. For New Age, for New Age, I'm gonna say um, "Pixel Bath" by Gene Dawson. Oh my God, a man after my heart. I <laughs> love Gene Dawson. Dude. That that is the most cohesive album I've heard in the last like ten years. That's not pop, like pushing the alternative front. Yeah, it is so uniform within itself. Mm-hmm. I so love unique. That to him yeah he's like a guy who like we said earlier it's clear he's pulling from so many different influences and resources he has songs that are total like 90s grunge he has like uh you know some trap he has some electronic music obviously there's a bunch of pop in there but there's a whole song in spanish oh yeah that's right that's right policia right is that what it is yeah yeah but yeah, that album's amazing. The album cover is amazing. When I saw that, I'm like, dude, you already know this is gonna be good. Yeah. It just it hits the nail on the head with how it sounds. Yeah. Gene Dawson is oh my god. With everything that he chooses as well for like his visuals outside of cover art, like the like the Spotify mm-hmm. um little video that plays or like his YouTube videos for the songs, it's just Whoever whoever he works on his creative shit with, <laughs> sorry if I can't swear. Um, oh, you totally can. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. I was refraining myself the whole time. Um, <laughs> I swear like a sailor. Um, oh, you could have been going off the whole time. <laughs> you got to make up for it these next ten yeah, minutes. Yeah, this fucking motherfucker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, his creative team is insane. Absolutely. Insane. And I know I he it, is in there as well. There's no way he's not. Yeah, I think he's definitely spearheading everything. I'm sure he's got a good handful of people that 
work with him on videos and photography and things like that but i bet oh yeah i bet it's like all coming from his mind for the most part yeah and um i'm kind of surprised he's not bigger than he is like he's he's definitely like an indie star at this point after pixel bath yeah but i feel like i feel like whatever the next thing he does it's gonna like blow up yeah also at the same time though i hope so too but at the same time i feel like music as a worldwide audience has strayed away from the rock alternative as the pop because back in the 90s to the early 2000s like that was pop green day blink 182 like that was they were the ones charting the billboard uh, all times and now it's kind of i mean it's a what is it ebbs and flows like it changes right. consistently or constantly so exactly i uh interviewed a guy right before you named johan lennox and oh, yeah. he he does uh a lot of like a arra- uh, like string arrangement orchestral stuff and he also releases a lot of his own music as well but he's really big into strings and and composing yeah and his composing credits are insane yeah he's not it's nuts i was blown away when i was like i can't believe i'm talking to this dude like <laughs> all the credits you have i'm like this is nuts yeah and he was uh i was like i have uh the next question i'm gonna ask you is okay. a dream artist or producer to work with and when i asked him that I wrote a couple down I thought would be cool for him to work with. And I said, Gene Dawson. He's like, oh, yeah, I worked with him. I'm like, cool, yeah. cool, 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 cool. <laughs> yeah, fucking whatever, dude. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> we get it, bro. Um, but, uh, yeah, he said he's got a new album or a new something coming out soon. So I was like, oh, that's great news. Bless. Bless. But, yeah, moving on, who would be your dream artist or producer to work with? Um... So now you we always see pop punk, the new punk kids. Travis Barker is in there. He is in there. Yep. I want to go to Fall Out Boy. I want to sit in the studio with Fall Out Boy and have yeah. like have Andy Hurley do the drums, Joe Troman do the guitar, Pete Wentz on the bass, Patrick Stone work on vocals with me. Like that's like my dream. Like in studio, like producer band collab um if i were to just like pick anyone like a singular person like an artist to work with definitely be dominic fike um yeah like i'm i'm not from here um i grew up in connecticut for 16 years but i've lived here like just as his music career was like coming out of like local and like when he just signed and all of that stuff um And so, yeah, like seeing how he as just as a person, like impacted, like the people I went to high school with, um, the siblings of the people I went to high school with, um, and how they treat everything with music down here. Cause down here, there's no music culture like at all. Um, but yeah, great guy. Love his music. He got me like into writing music when I was in my college dorm and like couldn't go to class and like could not get myself out of bed. Like I would listen to his demo tape and be like, I can do something like this. Wow. That's cool. So, yeah, Dominic Fike is the man and he's really blown up over the last two years or so. Maybe yeah. three. It's kind of funny how long he actually has been doing it because it still almost feels like he's new, but it's just because it's so fresh, right? Yeah. And then he, when he got signed, everyone was like, he had no music out. Wow. Everyone was like, who is this person? Yeah. So. Great answer. Um, question Thank number you. four is who's on your musical rotation right now? Oh, there's one kid named Kado. K-A-I-D-O. K-A-I-D-O. Okay. Yeah. Um, I am deeply embedded <laughs> like painfully embedded into like the hyper pop community okay, like it's yeah, yeah. it's all the connections i have like friends that i have and it's not a bad thing i know i just made it sound like a bad thing but um i don't even make that kind of music so yeah. um but this kid kato is insane um I'll, let me just go through like my like songs from like the last yeah. week 
So, uh, Waste by Kato, um, Tell Me by Corbin. Oh, dude, Charm Corbin. That's that's Spooky Black, right? Yeah, Spooky, Ooh, spooky Black. <laughs> dude, that first thing he ever put out was nuts. That was a huge moment for me when I first heard it. Yeah. Uh, what was it called? The What was the first thing he ever put out called? Under like, Spooky Black? Yeah, this is like the white EP. Yeah. I can't remember. But... You, you, I, I would have been like 11, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, that, I, it's sick. Um, yeah, sick. Uh, tell me about Corbin. Charmander by Amine. Oh, yes. I was listening yeah. to that today. That's a great song. Have you seen the video? Uh, I've seen clips because he posted them on his Instagram, but I didn't watch the whole thing. I, I swear to God, oh, Psycho Films, Jack Berger, the most insane director of, like, our generation. Okay, okay. He he does all of Dom's stuff. He does all of Amine's stuff. He did, what's that Kendrick song where it's the beginning? It's like, wah, uh, wah. Oh. You know what I'm talking about? Where the he, one where he did that the video. House, where he was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like. That was uh, on to Pimp a Butt. If these walls could talk? Yes, yes. Oh, wow. I can't believe I just pulled that out of the memory bank right now. Yeah, he did the videos for that. Sorry, I'm getting, like, sidetracked. But no, you're good. He's an insane director. Because, like, I, if I'm not making music, I'm involving myself so in something else creatively. So if it's, like, graphic work for, like, my friend's company. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Yeah, so let me finish I'll check out the video for it. Yeah, it's insane. Um... Stocked in by Poppy Chulo, TJ. Um, addic uh, geez. Addicted to Tattoos by Bella Pierce. Um, Jade by 4CF. Honest by She Loves Boone. Um, yeah, basically. You're giving me some, some new stuff to listen to. You'll have to shoot those over to me. I, I feel like I only listen to people under a certain amount of monthly listeners and there's like one or two outliers that just kind of sit in there like Amine. Right. Like everyone else is like 150,000 and below. Yeah. That's a cool uh, musical diet I feel like because not that many people are going to be listening to them so you're kind of absorbing yourself in this underground world that is going to come out in your music that most people probably yeah. won't be able to, to pin down immediately. Yeah, I found it's very easy to drown in it though, because uh, music, com new music comes out every minute. Yeah, man, that's so, for sure. Um, like, I mean, I could listen when I first heard the Kato song, and I was like, "This kid, like, this kid is good." Like, here's another, here's another person that just came out of nowhere. Like, right. they're amazing. Like, um, <laughs> it's yeah, great. Um, it's super easy to drown in it. Um, so gotta remove myself from yeah. it sometimes. Yeah, it's funny doing this podcast. This is like the definition of drowning in new music. Cause yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I always go to the, um, Spotify indie fresh finds page. Mm -hmm. Every few days there's like 10 new people at least that are putting oh. out new songs. So it's like const. I haven't been as like on top of it, uh, lately because I was, prepping for the hundredth episode but i'm gonna have to jump back into that water and it's i know it's gonna be intense because there's just so yeah. much good new music out all mm -hmm. the time yeah i like i i trust me i because i i work with um my friend jared at origin and like we do like the playlists and the articles yeah. for like underground artists and so it is always like Every day, it's like okay, new artists, right? New artists, they're fire. Let's get them in two weeks from now. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, the last question here before we're out is, what's your favorite decade of music? Seventies. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. have guessed. Wouldn't have guessed. I mean, the obvious answer for me is like two thousands, but to seventies. Um, like I have this whole playlist on Spotify that's like my mom would like this that's literally the name of it um, <laughs> that's funny and yeah and it has like I mean it dips into the 80s and the 90s a little mm -hmm. bit but um, it's mostly like classic rock and it's 
<clears throat> not like hair rock or like hair metal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like Elton John, Queen, like these, these are legends like beyond what like you and I could go to a concert and comprehend like the concerts they threw back then were insanity. What was, what was the one that they did for like world hunger and AIDS back in like the um, early eighties live aid. Yes. When queen performed that, it was just massive, unbelievable. massive. Yeah. Um, Steppenwolf. I listened to them from that era. I mean, the Beatles in that era were insane. Like the, yep. everything I stand for, like anti, let me let's take a step back. Um, like anti-war, um, kind of like questioning the system that they're a part of. Like the seventies is like where all of that like originated because of the Vietnam War. Like everything that was going on. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, you can't argue with the seventies for me. Yeah. Um, there's never a. There's not a wrong answer with that. I mean, there is no wrong answer because. Yeah. Every era is going to have amazing music and just shitty music. And it's funny. I always say this on the show, but I always think it's funny when people say, oh, man, music nowadays just sucks. It's like, <laughs> nah, you're just not trying hard enough. Like, you're not trying hard to find stuff. It's like, it's so easy to just go back to, like, what you are used to listening to. Yeah. But there's constantly new music that harkens back to those eras and just adds a new flavor to it and like i mean there's so much great stuff like that rock and roll is still alive there's still rock bands despite what people say maybe it's not the top of the charts but that doesn't mean that there aren't people that are making great rock music yeah it's still out there you just need to know where yeah awesome well north xix thank you for joining me for an episode of on that note everyone needs to go check out the new single santa monica boulevard out now on all streaming platforms thank you again man for joining me i really appreciate it it was awesome talking with you yeah thank you for having me man of course dude i'll talk to you later see you bye I got pretty habits, babe, I got when you look at me Thank you again for joining me for another episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. If you haven't yet, please make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts, and you can even leave a comment down below to let me know who you're listening to. On that note, I'll see you guys next time.